OK. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nevena Martinovic, and I will be chairing the panel today. Um, so Sandra's given us a wonderful little introduction. And if you have any other questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, so I am, well, I'm no longer actually an edu educational developer, development as associate at the Center for Teaching and Learning. I finished my tenure yesterday, but three of the lovely panelists on our, um, on our panel are actually the new EDAs. So they're there to su provide support for graduate students and teaching fellows, and you'll hopefully be able to reach out to them at some point during the year uh, and ask them any questions you have. I also just recently um, finished my PhD at Queen's, so I'm very familiar with uh, TAing at Queen's and everything that that involves. So before we introduce all our panelists, I just wanted to start off this morning with a land acknowledgement. I understand that right now we might not all be in Kingston or uh, what we are currently, the city that's currently known as Kingston. Um, but because that's where Queens is situated and it's where I am right now, um, that's the land that I'll be acknowledging. So Queens is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We're grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It's also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the Indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. The Centre for Teaching and Learning has a lot of resources, workshops and series on indigenizing curriculum and things like that. And that's something that I recommend everybody looks into over the course of their time at Queen's. Um, so to begin with, I wanted to just let each of the panelists introduce themselves, tell you what department they're in or what institutions on campus they are working with, and then also just give a little bit of a brief um, background of their experience TAing at Queen's. So that could involve kind of lab-based tutorials, um, humanities tutorials, just grading TA ships, anything that they might be involved in. And then right away, we're probably gonna open it up to questions just because we have such a large group. And um, this panel has um, historically had a lot of questions. So I wanna make sure that we get to them all. Um, and because it's recording, and I understand that people might not want to um, talk, uh, just put your questions into the chat box and I can read them for you. And then if we have more questions that we don't get to, we're always able to take questions by email so I can put the EDA email into the chat. And I'll do that in one second. But first, let me just get our panelists to introduce themselves. So um, Catherine, would you like to start? Sure, hello everyone. Um, this is gonna be really exciting, I think. Um, I My name is Catherine Mazurek and I am currently a third year PhD student in the Department of Gender Studies. I have been in a variety of different graduate programs. I have a very non-traditional path uh, since 2008 at Queen's, and I have TA'd in the departments of politics, gender studies, and music. So mostly discussion-based tutorials, but I've also done a great, a uh, large amount of being online. So I'm looking forward to discussing with everyone today things about TA. Thanks, Nevena. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Clarissa, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thanks so much for being here. Um, again, like Sandra said, I wish that we could all be together in person. Um, but my name is Clarissa May Delion. I'm going into the fourth year of my PhD program at the Faculty of Education. Um, I also did my master's at the Faculty of Education. So I've been here since um, about 2015. I've TA'd quite a bit and um, my my TA responsibilities have been really collaborative with course instructors and so I haven't done any tutorials but I've been very involved in development of courses of a development of assessments um, I am the first contact for students and I do a lot of administration of the courses I also do guest lectures and I've been head TA for for a course which involved mentorship of other TAs and delegation of work and 
and managing the team. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about some of those specific experiences throughout this session. Thanks, Nevena. Thanks, Clarissa. Um, Andres, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andres Ramos. I'm from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I'm doing my fifth year of PhD in Biomedical Engineering. Uh, I've been working as a TA and lead TA for three different courses, uh, lab-based and project-based. Um, I'm an international student, so if you have any questions rela related to TA as, as an international student, I'm here to help you. Thanks. Thank you so much. And finally, we have Hannah Skrinsky. Hello, can everyone hear me? Sorry, guys, I was having a bit of issues there. Uh, my apologies. Thank you, Nev. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I'm Hannah Skrinsky. Uh, I am a third year PhD student in the English department here at Queen's. Um, I have been TAing um, for about uh, four and a half years now. Um, I've TAed mostly for English courses, um, but those range from full year courses um, to just semester courses. So you do get a different kind of uh, experience and relationship with your students, um, depending on how long you're, you're with them and teaching with them. Um, and I've also uh, TA'd for uh, summer courses uh, through the writing, um, through the right discipline and the writing center as well. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here. I can't wait. TAing is a really interesting and different and scary experience, but it's really worthwhile. And uh, I know for most graduate programs, um, you're going to have a TA ship assigned to you. So this is a great, a great session to be on. It's going to be very helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. OK, thank you, everyone, for introducing themselves. Um, so I've opened the chat for people to ask questions. Um, and until that happens, I figured I would ask one question of my own. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of TA ships. And um, I think we've touched a little bit on tutorials, gradings. Some TA ships even uh, have guest lecture opportunities. So there's a lot of things that um, you might be required to do. The, the one thing that I find um, uh, that's a bit intimidating is that first tutorial or lab. So I wanted to ask all of you, how do you set up kind of an environment in this tutorial lab that you're running yourself? So uh, do you have any tips on that first class on kind of creating a little community or is that not related, nothing that you have to do in your discipline? So that's something that I think when I first started TAing, it was kind of the scariest thing for me. In my MA, I just got thrown into a tutorial without any kind of, um, that wasn't at Queens, don't worry. But I got thrown into a tutorial without really knowing what a tutorial was because in my undergrad, I'd never had one before. And then the question in the chat is, how do you create a sense of community through Zoom? So if you wanted to touch on that, maybe that difference between face-to-face -face and online, that would be great. Well, um, I can step in and speak to uh, the first sort of part of that question about creating a sense of communi community um, at, on the onset in your first first tutorial or lab. So um, I'm in the humanities, so we, we do tutorials. Typically, we don't have <laughs> many labs, um, but I found um, one of the best ways to sort of uh, read the room and get a feel for, you know, how your students are feeling and how you're feeling as well is to just kind of open it up and introduce yourself, introduce your your studies and what you're interested in and what you're specializing in and, you know, show them your passion for your subject because that passion is really going to translate into a better sort of um, community within the classroom itself, right? That's going to translate into, okay, she's here to, she's here to teach us. We're here to learn, you know, um, and she seems really invested in what she's doing, right? So um, don't be afraid to, you know, share with them what you're interested in doing and um, just communicate that passion forward. Um, and then I would also say, make sure, you know, you give some time for them to introduce themselves and maybe what they're thinking of majoring in, if it's a first or second year course. 
Um, and also, um, try and learn their names. It's really, really hard, but um, I would really suggest using name cards for like the first month or so. It sounds a little juvenile, but to be honest, I think people respond better when you take the time to get to know their names and know who they are as a person and as a student. So, um, you know, try and make that a priority for yourself. And it also just demonstrates to your students that um, you, you are here to try and teach them on a smaller scale than, you know, if they were at a 200 person lecture hall, right? You, this tutorial is for making those kind of relationships a little bit closer and giving them an opportunity to ask questions they may not feel comfortable asking the professor to you. So just make sure that you take the time in your first class to really sort of build those connections and introduce yourself and give them time um, to, to introduce themselves as well. Um, does anyone have any ideas on how to uh, kind of create that community in Zoom? I can start. So one of the things, I, I like Zoom rather than Teams because you can see all the panelists. I know that not everybody would like to have their video showing, but I think one option is to ask students to put an image instead of their video if they don't want that showing. And it doesn't necessarily have to be themselves if they aren't comfortable with that, but it could be something that... Um, represents themselves or something that they care about. I also think that icebreakers are still something that are really beneficial. It might be a little more challenging on Zoom and obviously this depends on how large the um, the tutorial groups your class sizes are, but I think kind of giving the entire like first um, tutorial just to talk about expectations and introduce each other is something that's really beneficial. Um, and there's a lot of online resources that um, we can discuss that you can kind of have group style workshops. So things like Padlet uh, is something that is good for having everybody kind of interact. Um, and then if you get more comfortable, there's things like breakout rooms where you can have smaller groups that start to talk to each other. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to add about that? I just want to sort of uh, reiterate uh, what Hannah said earlier about the importance of sort of making sure that you take the first step to introduce yourself. I feel like regardless of if you're doing a tutorial lab or if you're in a larger um, classroom situation, even though I've never done a tutorial and typically the classes I've taught, um, the smallest has been 40, the largest has been 200. Um, oh, sorry. I don't know why I said 200. It was 100. Um, <laughs> that's a very big difference. Um, but having that opportunity to sort of humanize who the instructors are, who your graders are, I think is really important um, for getting students uh, comfortable with the actual setting, you know, especially if you're teaching a first year class. University is a huge transition. They're going from a class with people that they've known, you know, for four years, perhaps throughout high school in very small classes to to a very different situation. Some of them, this is their first time living on their own. Um, having that opportunity to just sort of remind everyone that that this is a human experience is really important. And I agree with the point about icebreakers um, over Zoom. You can easily do things like talking circles. I just participated in um, a research sort of um, project where we use talking circles as a data collection method and even though it was over zoom we were still able to to use that method and so I would you know give it a shot and that's one way where you could like indigenize your classroom um, of course I would read up on it and make sure that you're using proper protocols and you give the history of talking circles but but you know um, I see I think that it's really important to dedicate that first class to just you know getting everyone a little relaxed um, so, so all good points that I've made, I, I basically just supported <laughs> what the other panelists have said, um, but I, that's all I have to contribute. <laughs> um, so Clarissa, we have one question asking, could you please explain what a talking circle is? So if you could just um, give a little bit of detail. Sure, so a talking circle is um, part of very common, it's a very common, um, indigenous ceremony. So uh, right now I'm in Kingston, which is tra traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and so talking circles have places in both um, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee teachings. And it's basically a way of facilitating discussions where if we were in person, we'd be sitting in a circle. And I believe um, for Anishinaabe, uh, 
we move to the left and we pass a talking object and whoever's holding the talking object um, is sort of the speaker for the moment. And if you don't want to speak, you can pass it on. And if you, I think Haudenosaunee tradition, you pass to the right. Um, and it's a really great way to sort of ensure that not only are you prioritizing listening, but you're giving space for folks to, to have their own space to talk. And it's a really wonderful way to, um, you know, for folks who, who maybe feel a little intimidated by discussion or feel like they're a little quieter, it gives them a chance to speak. And it also sort of just like silences the room so that we can be really attentive in our listening. Um, and uh, usually uh, we do, I think for Anishinaabe, teaching it's three rounds. So you pass the circle three times. And when I was doing the data collection that I mentioned earlier, we sort of grounded it with a question. In the past, when I've um, used talking circles in my classes, I grounded it in a question. Um, so, so I'm not sure if uh, you had any other follow-up questions, um, but, but that's the, the really brief description. Okay, thank you, Clarissa. Uh, Carly's added that the direction depends on the sun or the moon, depending on the given tradition and culture. Uh, we have another question, and I think it's a good reminder of both of these things that we might need to um, define the terms we're using, because obviously they're not familiar to everybody. Um, but the question is, what is the difference between a tutorial class and a normal one? Hannah, do you want to take this one? I see your hands up. Yeah, I absolutely can. Um, so a, a tutorial class is um, typically what happens when you're getting a large uh, lecture class that has 100 plus students. Um, what the professor will do is have multiple TAs for that class. And um, I know in the English department, we break up those uh, say 200 students into TA sections. So a TA will have say 20 or 25 students. So there'll be about four or five TAs per tutorial. So those sections are also tutorials. So what we do is we meet once a week. Uh, typically it can be, it depends on how your department is structured. It can be twice a week or, or more or less. Um, but in the English department, um, we have a tutorial in addition to our lectures twice weekly. So the tutorial once a week will be hosted by your TA and you essentially expand upon or elaborate um, on the lecture material that the professor had discussed with them. And um, sometimes tutorials can be, say they can highlight one aspect of like a learning outcome. So uh, for the English department, tutorials are a really great way to teach uh, academic writing and how to write an essay. So the lecture could be focused on close reading perhaps, and then our tutorial for that week can talk about how to write an essay based on that close reading uh, lecture. So tutorials are really kind of opportunities for TAs to um, feel more, sorry, <laughs> form those relationships with their students and um, really kind of talk about specific sort of aspects of the course. And it's a kind of an opportunity to um, give students, you know, a smaller environment from which to study and to which to ask questions because, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but my first, you know, huge lecture hall experience was god awful. It was so intimidating. So the tutorials sort of act as um, kind of smaller subsects of, of that lecture. Um, I think that covers the gist of it. I'm not sure how labs work though, so that could be maybe answered by someone else or Andreas. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. In case of labs, it's quite different because normally you would have a set of problems to solve. Uh, the professor would give this set of problems to the TAs. So the TAs would have to prepare for these and get all the materials needed to explain is right. So that's mostly in like a math based uh, course, right? Um, and then there are tutorials for labs where you can, I don't know, learn to solder an electrical component or connect a sensor to an Arduino, things like that. So, but again, uh, like Hannah said, this is a space where you can meet with the students and collaborate more, build these relationships, and of course, help them beyond what they can get in a normal class. That's, I think, the difference. 
Yeah, and I'm not sure how, if it's this way in all departments, but for the most part, um, that group you have in your tutorial, you'll be marking their work. So it's also their time to familiarize themselves directly with the marker and ask them maybe some more specific questions that they might not have the opportunity to. But really, this is one of those things where you'll, if you have these questions, I would definitely advise you, like, ask your instructor beforehand. Ask them, is the tutorial or lab a place for the students to be mostly talking or for the tutorial leader to be mostly talking? So try to, I think it's a good idea to ask those questions beforehand. And we have a TA toolkit on the CTL, and it has a list of questions you might want to ask your instructor before your first um, time teaching just so that you make sure that everything is really um, not necessarily concrete because things change, but just so you feel more confident. And in terms of feeling confident, we have a question from Jennifer, which is, um, is it appropriate to tell your students that this is your first time TAing and that you're going to be learning as well? Or is that going to freak your students out? I can, I can. Uh, start us off. Um, I'm of the position that that operating with uh, a level of honesty and transparency is always um, good, good pedagogy. Um, and sorry, I'm I'm a former teacher, or I guess I'm I'm still a current teacher. But pedagogy is sort of like the practices and decisions that we make as teachers, sort of like um, uh, the choices that we make when we're instructing students, and um, you know, you'll be surprised that that, you know, showing that level of vulnerability is, in my experience, has always been appreciated by students. Um, and it, it also sort of creates a sense in the classroom where they can also approach you with their own vulnerabilities. Like I said, like university is so many experiences and it can be very difficult and often students don't feel like they can admit when they don't know something where they when they feel like there's like a skill that they don't have and something that they don't know, they often feel afraid to ask questions. So I think that if you start off by saying, you know, I'm going, I'm learning as well, that kind of diffuses the situation and it creates opportunities for them to, to approach you. So um, that is something I'm very comfortable with, but I think it's also a very personal decision. I don't think it's gonna detract anything from your teaching if you, if you personally choose not to offer that information. Um, but in my experience, it, it hasn't caused any sort of ne negative repercussions to sort of admit, oh, hey, um, you know, I there there may some, be some things that I don't know how to do. There may be some things that I try and it doesn't work. And, and we're all sort of in this process together. But at the end of the day, I do think it's a personal decision and it depends on whether or not it's going to make you more or less confident. Thanks, Clarissa. We have a bunch of questions coming in, so I want to um, just... I mean, if you have something very important to add, that'd be great, but um, maybe after one person gets to talk, we can move on to another question. Um, but just to add to that, I would say that you can also do a feedback in your tutorials, like halfway through the year, and then the students can let you know, like, this is really working, or can we also do this? And um, that's something we can also discuss if someone's interested. So our next question is, I was wondering if there's a preparation conducted by the professor to the TAs. Is there training before conducting lab practices or tutorials and how much time you get to prepare? So this is going to be something that's individual to the disciplines, but if somebody wants to talk about their experience, that would be great. Yeah, I can start. Um, in case of um, engineering labs and uh, these kind of preparations, uh, normally you won't have time to discuss this with the like in detail with the professor. So he or she will tell you, this is what you have to cover. This is the material you have to prepare it. So it's important that you take some time. Uh, obviously, this counts as you, your TA hours uh, to get ready to give this uh, material to the student, to the students. And of course, you have to know everything in advance. Don't wait to, for the last minute to start a lab and just saying, yeah, I, I've done that before. I'm sure it's going to be OK. There's always things that happen at the last moment. So at least try your labs once before you, you start teaching one lab. Um, yeah, I guess that answers a few of those questions. 
Thank you. Catherine, was there something you wanted to add to that? I saw your hand. Um, yeah, so I was just going to say, usually when you get your TA contract at the beginning of the term, um, your instructor has specified how many hours you have a week to do preparation. So, for example, one of the courses that I TA for quite often, you know, we get, um, we're told that we should be going to two out of three lectures per week. Or no, there are only two. So we should be going to both lectures actually in the week. And then um, we're given like a certain amount of time for reading the material as well to prepare for the activities that, they, that were done in the tutorial. So that's one of those things that should be spelled out for you at the beginning when you receive your TA contract, not the one from like HR in the electronic system, but you also should get, um, I think most disciplines, you get one that's like handwritten by the instructor that shows what the breakdown of your hours and your time would be. And that gives you a sense also of how they intend for you to prepare for the session. Thank you, Catherine. And I think this is a good time to just have a statement that says it's really important to keep track of your hours. Um, our TA union is PSAC and on their website, they have a, an app you can download that keeps track of your hours. You just input it and say what you were doing during that time. And if you find yourself, you know, maybe one term you have a million emails and another term you have two. If you find that you're getting close to your hours, reach out to your instructor before that happens and ask them like, how do you want to um, a lot figure this out? You don't want to be doing, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of times I've ended up doing additional work, but we're trying to mitigate that. So keep track of your hours and reach out if you're getting close. You don't want to de be doing this work for free. It's a lot of, um, it, it, is, it is work and it's a great opportunity, but it's also hard work. Um, Carly has a question. After you mark an assignment, does that get reviewed by the instructor before marks are given out to students? So this is something that's also probably discipline specific, but does anyone want to speak to their experience with that? Hannah, I see your hands up. Hey, um, yeah, so um, this is it is specific to disciplines and also to professors as well. There's not really a, a hard and fast rule for it, but I've had experiences where um, after I've marked my my assignments for my students, um, my professor will always want to know the median and the mean. Um, and then, but he won't actually go through and check all of my assignments. So I think there's that level of trust there most of the time with professors and TAs um, where, you know, they trust that you are, you know how to mark this assignment and they should, they should typically go over sort of what the expectations are for that course and what you should be looking for. There should be, you know, rubrics um, to help you with that. Um, but they don't necessarily always go through and look and check um, check all of your marking, um, but they do typically want to know, you know, what's the class average for your section of students. Um, that's most my the experience that I've most often had as a TA. Um, Sometimes uh, I, I have heard sometimes uh, professors will, you know, ask to see your uh, your section, um, but I haven't always had that experience. I've had that one time, um, so it's not usually the norm in English anyway, um, but for the most part, I think normally um, they're just going to ask for specific uh, figures like the mean or something, um, but they're not necessarily going to look through um, all of your all of your assignments. Thank you. Clarissa, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, so I've never um, worked with a professor who's asked to sort of review my assignments afterwards, but what has often happened in my case is that um, either before the assignments are in at the beginning of the year or right when they start coming in, we sit down and we go over the rubric together. We mark a few together. Um, and I don't know if that's typical of other departments at the Faculty of Education. Everything we do is quite meta because who we're teaching are future teachers. And so we try to practice what we would like them to do with their students. Um, but usually just to make sure everyone's on the same page, we either co-develop the assessments together, including the rubrics and everything, or we sit down and just make sure that we have the same understanding of what the criteria are. Catherine, did you want to add one last thing before we move on? Yeah, just really quickly. Um, so in some of the TA environments I've been in, if 
there are people who have had, if it's your first year TAing for that course, for example, on the first assignment, the instructor might ask you instead of publishing your marks right away to save as draft. And then that way you have the opportunity to not like publish it directly to the student in on cue, but you can either go back to the instructor after you've done all of them and like say like, oh, I had a question about this one, or you can go to the head TA and say, oh, I had another question about this one. So just so, you know, if you're nervous because it's your first time grading something, just know that in on cue there is that save drafts option. And you might be one of those people who prefers to do all of them, save them as a draft, and then, you know, maybe reach out and ask questions, or maybe you might think at that point, no, I've really got this. And then you can just go back and publish them all quite quickly. So I just wanted to remind people that that feature is there and it exists. Thanks, Catherine. And I think that's a really good point that if you ever feel like really unsure, it's better to ask before you publish it, right? So just email your prof and say, hey, I'm not really sure about this one. These are my, my concerns. And then they'll be happy to look at it. They'd rather you do that beforehand than after the student sees the grades. Um, so the next question we have is from Jesse, which is, as people learning how to TA, it's helpful to talk about our experiences. However, when does sharing what happens in the classroom with others become unprofessional? Oh, Catherine, I see has her hand up. Catherine, would you like to take it away? Um, so I think this is a good question because it is like you're learning too and we're all in different processes of our learning journeys. And so my like I'm just going to speak for myself. My general rule of thumb is that if I am talking about something that's had in a classroom, I don't identify the student. And if I'm talking about it for the purposes of like a concern I have or if like I think I handled something not as well as I could have handled it and I'm trying to ask a peer of mine like, is there a way that you would have done this differently than how I did it? Or was this OK? Um, do you think do you have feedback? So those things I think are OK. But I think for me, like I try and ask myself the question, like, am I sharing this for the purposes of my own growth or am I sharing this because it's gossip? And that for me is like the um, the line of where it is. Like if I'm sharing it because I'm trying to better myself or I'm trying to like find a way to better address something in the classroom and I don't share the names of the students, I think that that's like like a professional way of behaving in it. But if I'm if I'm sharing it because like it's like this salacious thing that just happened and it's like, oh my God, you'll never believe then I find that to be like on the side of unprofessionalism. Thanks, Catherine. I would agree with that. And I think usually we say like don't post it on social media. Um, but I have on Twitter, because I think academic Twitter is a big thing. I've seen um professors who are kind of proud of something that happened in their classroom, ask their class, like, can I post this on Twitter? And they'll post something with permission of their class. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, Robin has shared the link to the PSEX time tracker in the chat. Uh, there's also a link to that in our TA toolkit. And I'd really recommend going through that before you start TA. Lauren asks, what are some of the marked differences between TAing a first year course versus a second or third year course? Clarissa has her hand up. Would you like to go? Sure. So um, the first course I ever TA'd for was actually a first year course. And um, as I mentioned earlier, before I started graduate school, I was a middle school, middle school teacher and I taught grades six to eight. And um, something that really surprised me with working with first year students is how similar they were to my sixth graders. And I think it's because um, in my middle school, sixth graders were sort of the transition year. They It was their first year in their middle school, and so everything was new and exciting. Everything was different and kind of intimidating. It was their first time. Um, it was their first time having lockers. It was their first time having a rotating schedule. And, and as ex exciting as all that stuff was, it was also really overwhelming. And I had to like meet, like think about all, a lot of emotional needs for, for my sixth graders. And with the first year, um, students that I worked with, I was expecting sort of full adults and um, it wasn't the case. I had a bunch of students who, who, like I said earlier, never lived on their own, didn't understand like, you know, basic needs, like when they should get groceries, like when they should be sleeping, how to like regulate their time. And it ended up being that year, me just trying to care for 
like not only their learning, but also their general well-being and trying to find resources to connect them to so that their transition to first year was a lot easier. And you, you'll still have that in second and third year, but they're a little more independent because they already have that first year over like under their belt. And and what I would say is if you are TAing for a first year course to, you know, give a little bit of grace to how difficult that transition can be if you are 18 years old and this is your first time in university. Um, and, and understand that emotional needs and well-being needs Im greatly impact learning. And so if there is a time when they feel really overwhelmed by instructions for an assignment that seem really straightforward, maybe it's not because they're not understanding the instructions, but everything else in their life is just a lot right now. And you just need to sit down and really like calm them down. And as someone who's going to be working with them a little more closely than perhaps the course instructor, that is a position you're in to sort of really help their learning experience. Um, so that is probably the biggest difference for me in my experiences working with first year students is, is that um, they're not as independent and, and um, a, a, like independent and just sort of as confident as the older students with some of the other aspects of university life. Thanks, Clarissa. And I think that's a really great point. It, um, while we are, you know, academics instructors, they have a lot of questions. So just familiarizing yourselves with those resources that you can provide to them. That way, like you're not taking on work that you are not trained and don't know how to do. But you can say, you know, we have Queen's University's International Center. If you're an international student and you have questions about some things, we have the Four Directions Indigenous Center. We have a uh, the student academic uh, success services in the library where they can do more hands on writing help. So there's a lot of resources on campus that they might not know about and that can be where you can provide that for them. Um, and I also want to say that in terms of I think what we're trying to show here is that not everybody involved in this um, panel and we don't all have the same kind of foundational knowledge. So I might know things about one discipline, someone else might know something about another discipline. So we find ourselves explaining terms and that might be something you have to do more in a first year course. Even things that seem really obvious to you like what are office hours, first year students might not know that, especially first generation students. So even just telling them these are the variety of things you can come talk to me about, they might not feel comfortable doing that right away. So just kind of being a little more transparent than you think you might need to be. Uh, Jefferson has a question about dress code. Uh, should I aim to look more formal like a professor or more casual like a student? I'm an international student and where I'm from, we and the professors usually dress very casually. So uh, if somebody wants to speak quickly on that one. Um, I guess I can give some advice. Um, I, I think um, when you start as a TA, uh, dressing a little bit less casual than a student can give you a little bit of help in terms of showing that you have some authority in the class. So if you think you, you need that help, that that could be good to, to do. Uh, of course, you, you don't want to overdress and be more formal than the professor. Even professors sometimes don't wear that formal. So um, yeah, so at the end, I, I think it, it depends on you. Uh, as long as you show some professionalism, it's, it's fine. And I think that if you look at our panelists, they're all dressed in things that they're comfortable in, uh, but also that they want other people to see them in. So that's kind of what I think of is comfortable and confident. Whatever makes you feel like you're, like you can, I don't know, you can work, but you're also, you know, happy to be seen in it. That's, that's it. If you look at the professors, you'll see what people in your department dress, de uh, generally dress like. But there are people in our department who wear um, full suits and others who are very, very casual. So it's really, um, it's really about you, as Andres said. Um, so we have one question that is a little bit more general. Um, uh, Rukaya says, this is my first time as a TA and I was wondering what the general process from the beginning to the end is. And I think that when it comes to those kind of really large questions, like it's your TA experience is going to depend on um, everything like the, it, it's, it's all going to be um, relative but if you would like to make an appointment to talk to an EDA before your first TA ship and kind of get your some of your concerns out 
um, I definitely recommend that. And I can, if uh, Robin, if you could post the email address for the EDAs, um, and then here we'll try to focus on um, some more specific questions that might be helpful to everyone. Um, so we have Jameson asking, do you have any advice for TFs or profs to make TAs feel comfortable and confident in their work? Um, Hannah, you can go. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, I see you have. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I'm having some hand issues, virtual hand issues. Okay, um, so I would say um, in order to make your TA feel comfortable, if you are a teaching fellow or a professor, um, I would say, you know, we've been gesturing towards these kind of um, these meetings sometimes that you'll have with your professor to go over rubric or go over your contract. Um, Typically, those are sort of those are the best way to sort of build that relationship with your TA if you are the professor or instructor is to have those meetings with your fellow TAs to sort of uh, understand what's expected of you, what your contract looks like, make sure you're familiar with that. Um, and also just to go over, you know, what kind, what we're really looking for, what the learning objectives are for that class and how you're supposed to go ahead and facilitate those as a TA. So if you don't have those kind of meetings at the beginning or through the middle of the term with your professor, ask for them. Ask for potentially a 15 minute meeting to go over uh, these questions that you might have. Um, know that your professor is there to to help you, right? Uh, you guys are on the same team and you guys have the same objectives, which is to teach your students, right? So um, make sure you know you ask those questions when you need to. Um, and um, you know, email your professor if you're unsure. Maybe even if there's a lot of TAs um, in that particular uh, class, um, you guys can start like a Facebook chat or something like that. I've done that with um, larger, uh, larger sections where there were multiple TAs for one single class. And it was also really helpful because then we got to share our experiences and a lot of the experiences were similar. And then we got to sort of work through some issues that we might have been having um, in our own sections together, right? Um, so um, just don't be afraid to ask your professor things. And, and as a professor, you know, I would just say, make sure that you're available for your TAs because you guys all want to do the same thing. You all want to do a good job for your students. So um, just forming those, those connective, um, those communication lines is really important, I think. Clarissa, was there something you wanted to add? I see your hands up. Yeah, I'll just I'll make it quick because I see the next question from Miriam and I think it's uh, it's really important. Um, but I just want to add that if you are a TF um, that, you know, TAs need positive feedback too. Um, the best professors I've worked with are the ones who actually took time to say, you know, I reviewed the work you've been doing. This is the work that I really like that you've been doing. And if there is room for improvement, you know, being really sort of uh, gracious and, uh, you know, understanding with that kind of feedback as well, rather than sort of like judgmental and harsh, which I, you know, I've never experienced. Um, but, and I also think, um, giving opportunities for leadership, but not making it like sort of like a pressure cooker situation where people f feel like they have to take those up. So I've always been offered opportunities for guest lectures for leadership, but I always appreciated the opportunity to say, um, I'm not in a position to take this on. Maybe my research is taking priority right now. And so, you know, um, creating opportunity, but not making it feel like it's an obligation, then also making sure that, that, um, we're getting feedback as well. And then also, if you're not getting offered the feedback, I would really encourage seeking it out. I think that's some great points from Clarissa on what you can do as a TF or a prof. And exactly like in an orientation at the beginning, just ask like, what do they hope to get out of the TA ship? Um, what are they interested in specifically to that class? Um, and I think a lot of people don't know that if they guest lecture or do something like that, they can ask the prof to write a letter about the guest lecture that they can put in their teaching dossier later. And we also do that at the CTL. We can do classroom observations if you get the opportunity to guest lecture. Um, so Ty Tyler asks if Queens uses Turnitin to verify authenticity. So Queens does have Turnitin that the prof can add to the on queue. So it just depends on whether your prof is using Turnitin and what they're using it for. 
So that's something that you want to ask beforehand when you first have your marking meetings. Some do, some don't. So it's very dependent, but we um, Queens does have it if the props want to use it. OK, let me just scroll down. Um, um, so Mariam asks, what is the best way to deal with harsh criticism from a student following a bad grade? I'm a first time TA and I'm not sure how to handle that conversation. OK. Uh, I can start off, but but I feel like probably all of us will um, have interesting insights since we're all from different departments. But my biggest thing is to make sure that your course instructor is supporting you. There's no worse feeling than having a student come to you, question their grade, be really sort of um, aggressive with it, and then have your course instructor sort of like like devil back and say okay i'm just going to override um what your ta said and i'm very lucky that's never been the case but um i always speak the, to the course instructor first i give my reasoning as to why i gave the assessment i am very thorough with my feedback not very thorough like within reason but i make sure that i i feel really strongly about the grade i'm giving and i, I make sure i can make an argument for it um, and then I present that argument to the course instructor. And if it gets to a point where you feel really uncomfortable with how the student is approaching you, um, ask the course instructor to intervene. Um, and and honestly, know know the limits of your job. If if the conversation isn't moving forward and they're not necessarily understanding the points that you're making. Um, and your course instructor is supporting you, that's just the end of the conversation and be OK with moving on from that. Um, you know, it's really hard when you want to be liked by your students and someone is telling you very, very clearly that they do not like you. But uh, at the end of the day, your job is to help them learn and no one learns if you sort of give them false feedback or if you give them a grade that doesn't make sense. Um, and and so my my biggest thing is make sure your course instructor is an ally for you as much as possible. Um, I'm very lucky, like I said, that I've only had course instructors who I've had positive relationships with, so I wouldn't necessarily know how to navigate a relationship where where I don't have that positive relationship with. But also just know what your own limits are, and if you don't feel comfortable pursuing the conversation, just pass it off to some, uh, like another authority figure, the instructor, or just end the conversation and just stand by your grade. Make sure that you have a good argument for it. Uh, that's it. OK, I see that Catherine has her hand up as well. Catherine, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think those are great points, Clarissa. And I think part of it, like with having supportive instructors, like the instructors also know that if like someone comes to them and they don't back their TAs in their grading, like as long as they're reasonable, right? And also everyone makes mistakes. That's the other thing. Like don't feel like, I mean, obviously you're gonna try as hard as you can to do the best grading, but I mean, sometimes you click the wrong box by mistake, it like mistakes happen, right? So that that's one thing to like keep in mind. But the, like the instructors also know that if they like, cave like not that I mean that in a bad word but like if they don't support you and your grading then they're gonna have to revisit and grade like all your students by themselves because once like one of them says that that's gonna happen then it goes through the whole network and then you know everybody knows that you know they're like maybe this one TA, you know that the instructor isn't supporting the TA so I've never and I've TA'd for like maybe 10 or 15 different instructors. I've never had an experience where like my grading hasn't been supported or if there was like a mistake because I have made mistakes before, you know, then it becomes more of a conversation. But what I generally do is at the beginning of the TA meeting when they're when your instructors going through with your hours in your contract, I like to ask them how they prefer to handle questions about grading because this will vary also from instructor to stru instructor. Some of them will say I want to handle all grading disputes because they want to know about it or for whatever reason that is their own and others will say well no I want them to go first to you and get more explanation and then if they're not satisfied then they come to me so in in the second scenario I generally like I'm very I'm like Clarissa I think I provide a lot of feedback like not an overwhelming amount but you know like a good amount of feedback and so if they still have questions then I actually prepare like a little like brief with like even more points that I didn't include in the first feedback and then say like do you I, I let them I give it to them and I let them read it in the meeting where they're telling me that they don't think they got a high enough mark and then um, I ask them if they have any other questions and I've actually never 
had someone have further questions or escalate from that point. So uh, I see that Andres also has his hand up. Thanks, Catherine. Yes, uh, I think uh, besides what Clarice and Catherine have told you, um, you could also have a 24 hour period where the student just comes down and gets back to you and provides some details on why he or she thinks that the, the grade is bad. And once they go over that and realize that, oh, maybe I didn't look at this like properly, then you have the chance to, or they have the chance to think about it. And you don't have to do that extra work of providing even more feedback or going to the professor and say, okay, I have a problem with a student. Uh, professors don't want that. So just give them some time, uh, let them think about it. And then if they really think uh, something has to change, then listen to them. I think that's a great point. Thank you. Um, one of the things I do is when I'm an instructor is I ask that the students wait 48 hours after they receive a grade back before emailing their TAs. And I find that really helps. So you can talk to your instructor and ask, you know, what is the policy? Like, do I need to respond to students right away? How, how long do I wait? Things like that can really help just that cool down. And um, always, I think that it's always good that when a student's emailing you, whether they're happy or sad with their mark, just open by saying, you know, thank you so much for reaching out to me. I like, I appreciate that you're contacting me. What are the specific things you'd like to discuss? Because I think as Andres said, um, sometimes they just generally say, I don't like the mark I got. And there's, that's not really a productive way forward. So trying to get them to really come in on what, um, what their, what their concerns are. Uh, so Carly asked a question that I think um, we've touched on now, which is how does the appeal process work for an assignment? Does the TA remark it or does the or course instructor do it? And so as um, everyone said, that's something that's dependent on the teacher. So ask them in advance, do they want the appeals to go through you or from someone else? Um, okay, so we have a couple of questions. We only have six minutes left. So I want to encourage everyone to email the questions that we didn't get a chance to answer and um, the EDAs of three of which are on our panel, Clarissa, Andres, and Catherine, um, will be able to help provide you with some of that support. Uh, the last question that I just want to quickly talk about is, Michael asks, what do students typically call the main softwares? So OnQ is the learning managing system for Queens. Um, that is what Queens calls it, but it's also um, known as D2L, Design to Learn, or Brightspace. We also have Solus, which is where the students will be um, seeing their grades and signing up for courses. Those are the main things that the students will be focusing on. Um, and we have wonderful ITS at Queens, and we have um, people who work at the CTL who are very trained on OnQ. And if you don't know how to use any of these systems, ask your instructor if they can set up a little training period before the, um, before the first um, day of class. Because we are having this um, switch to kind of remote teaching, these are important things to know. And it's a lot faster to get the training ahead of time than to be asking questions afterwards. So if um, I just want to invite all of our um, panelists, if there's any kind of last burning desire tips that you want to throw out there before we start wrapping up, um, I encourage you to share those things now. And I see Hannah has her hand up. <laughs> I just want to say um, thank you uh, for having me here today. First of all, this has actually been really informative for me too. Um, but I just want to say if you're first year TA and you're getting really nervous and you, you feel like you don't know anything and imposter, imposter syndrome is, you know, getting pretty bad, um, I would just say, you know, relax. You do know your stuff and you still know more than your, than your students. So <laughs> there's that. Um, but just know they take this as a, as a learning opportunity for yourself too, right? And make sure that you do get feedback from your students. So you, you it's scary, but you need to know what you're doing right and what you can work on. So are you asking too closed-ended questions? Are you moving too quickly from topic to topic? Um, do they need more individual writing time or something like that? These are things that you won't know unless you ask them. So take the opportunity um, in the middle of the semester at the end of the year to get feedback feedback from your students um, because it is really going to help you in the long term um, 
as you continue being a TA at Queens. So I, I know it's scary, but but do it anyway because it's it's really beneficial for you in so many ways. That's all. <laughs> uh, thanks, Hannah. I see Andres has his hand up. Yes, uh, just to make a last comment and also kind of answering Thiago's uh, questions about discrimination and some kind of psychological um, tiredness because of the TA. Uh, yes, there are many things that you can do about it. First, uh, talk to the professor and share these situations. You can get help in, in many ways. Uh, we are having actually uh, a webinar later this week uh, in terms of um, inclusivity. Uh, I'm sure you will find that helpful. Uh, but yeah, keep that communication with your uh, professor or the instructor. And yes, never like keep that to, to yourselves. Thank you so much. And I think that's also a good um, uh, to say that we have a lot of other things happening this week. And throughout the whole year, the CTL has a lot of workshops and seminars that uh, you can go to for more information. Uh, and there's also other groups across campus. So there's the Human Rights Office. Um, there's an Expanding Horizons workshops uh, through the uh, School of Graduate Studies. There's a lot of things on campus that can help support you. So you're not alone and we're all here for you. And um, I also just want to take a, t a moment to thank everybody for coming. We did not expect this many registrants and such amazing questions. And I want to thank all of our panelists for being here today and sharing some of their wisdom. It's I've also learned a lot. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank it's you, everyone. Pleasure. Yeah. yeah.